I'm using a little bit of Mars uh, violet there. It's a very nice, cool color. I go back to the top of the painting. And um, put in some more of that dark that I see with the burnt umber. Now burnt umber will go uh, it'll dry and go some <clears throat> somewhat lighter, so it has to be uh, sometimes sprayed with a retouch varnish to bring it back to its depth of color. <clears throat> I want to soften the edges on the hairline especially. The hairline is never, almost never hard edge unless it's, unless it is an actual edge. But of course you've got shadow on both the right side and then of course the left, as, as I'm looking at my canvas, this left side uh, goes into shadow before it hits the hair. And those soft and softened edges give the whole thing some dimension. I'm going <clears> to <throat> go back into the right eye, uh, or her left eye, my the right eye on the canvas. Now, as the uh, light side, the cheek on this light side approaches the hair, it gets warmer, but I'm not going to go into the cad red light. I'm going to use that barn red, which is actually almost a slightly redder version of, of Terra Rosa. state that uh, color on the inside of her eye, the shadow color. I don't want it quite that dark. That's pretty dark. Let's use some Terra Rosa. That's an appropriate color.
reshape a little bit the, the eyebrow and thicken it out here on the right hand side on my canvas. And I'm going to get some transparent oxide red to come in there and restate, redraw this line of the uh, upper lid. Give it a little bit more contrast. I'm using black again to get as deep a value as I can. Of course, I could go deeper, but uh, I might be too lazy to mix a lizard and thalo uh, green, which might go even deeper. And by the way, I use the same combination to paint white sometimes. That is a lizard crimson and uh, thalo green because they have Aura Viridian, which is a lighter version of the same color. Because they neutralize so beautifully. You can go slightly pink and slightly blue-green or blue with the same combination of color. I think it's right, really right in, in the right spot. And I'm going to darken all this behind you a little bit. And it's really kind of a blue-green, so I'm going to throw in, get a bigger brush because I'm going to work a little larger. Uh, yellow ochre. And ultramarine blue. And we're going to, let's see, eh, it's a little bit. Too dark. Yeah, um, all right, I like that color. It's sort of a neutralized blue. And we'll work up out of this blue-green color into that bright blue that's up there. Uh, that's a little too neutral. Let's see. But as we were saying, just as the last tape ended, I keep going back into the, the face and doing little things that I see 
might make it a little bit better. And obviously we see more occasionally that we didn't see before. And that's sort of the pattern of the painter's life, you know, when you start painting. Um, you you have this problem of seeing things that are not seeing things, and then as you keep continue, you see more and more and more. But that that is a, a visual process. It, it's actually making progress where you begin to see things you never saw before. But I think it always happens, you know, throughout the artist's life. You're, you're continually looking at stuff and, and analyzing things and, and uh, seeing more and more. Um, and there are people, of course, who aren't willing to give it that kind of labor and that intensity to keep keep looking and keep trying to improve what they're they're working on. And of course, if, if you can see something to make better, you continue painting on it. You, a painting is finished when you can't see anything else that you can do to f make it better. For me, you know, maybe some And I have a, a lot of artists that I admire. Some of them are impressionistic, like Richard Schmidt, um, but his drawing skills are really superb. Um, but he makes his paint look like he's thrown it on from across the room. And uh, it's a lot of fun. He just has, it looks like he's just having fun with the paint. And then there's the really polished paintings like uh, Nelson Shanks, and I really enjoy his works. His, his works are really so unbelievable. It's just hard to imagine that a person looks that hard at something to get all of the edges and the modeling so perfect and so intense <clears throat> that it's super real. It's super masterful. It's, uh, but you have to see his work in person because the uh, prints, uh, prints of it just don't do it justice. So as you you know look at very art, various artists' work, uh, there there are things that make their work important. For Rembrandt, for instance, his, his abilities were quite unique in that his characters came through in, in his paintings. There's a depth of humanity in the faces of all the pieces that, all the portraits he painted that you just don't see in other artists' work. It's just like you can tell what they're thinking by what's on their faces. And it's, um, it's a phenomenal thing. You just don't see anybody quite like that. <clears throat> the great portrait painters we were to make a list. I think we'd probably have to start in the Baroque period. Velasquez. Velasquez was a marvelous portrait artist. <clears throat> and uh, very subtle colors, but 
understood what the paint did and what happens when you look at a portrait visually. Sometimes he eliminated backgrounds because he knew that uh, people really look at a central object and then don't pay attention to things in the background. So he would uh, sometimes eliminate backgrounds. Something that Manet did later in the Impressionist period. And then there was Franz Hall's. Uh, his, his paintings were slapdash so quick, he, he could paint a portrait, literally, in uh, perhaps less than an hour. And uh, sometimes he had to kind of fool around with it a while just so that people would uh, know or, or feel that they were getting their money's worth just because he was so fast. And, uh, <clears throat> did an extremely beautiful work. And then John Sargent came along and said, you need to study Halls and you need to study uh, Velasquez. Um, and then Sargent ended up being one of the most uh, admired portrait painters of all time. And uh, he, again, was able to get a lot of character coming through in his, in his paintings. It was really amazing. He could, uh, people said if you went to pose for Sargent, you went to be judged because they felt like he would get their characters so well on canvas. But Sargent's reply to that was, I do not judge, I chronicle. In other words, he just was painting what he saw in front of him. <clears throat> but he was still able to get the character coming through. Or he was able to get a character or some something from the, the person. Uh, like he was commissioned to paint Teddy Roosevelt <clears throat> and couldn't get a pose that he thought was imposing or uh, the character of Teddy Roosevelt. So he led him around the White House and, and had him, uh, you know, pose in various places until he, obviously Teddy Roosevelt was getting a little bit annoyed. And so he put his arm on his hip and his right hand on the, on the top of the uh, piece of furniture and uh, actually this was in a stairwell and all of a sudden John Sargent said hold that pose that's what I want <laughs> and he pulled out his got his paints and started paint, painting Teddy Roosevelt in that exact pose so he felt like he was you know getting the character to come through and that's the that's the portrait we have of Teddy Roosevelt so again, I'm, what I'm doing right now is just massing in these shapes, and the modeling will come later. Um, you can see something of this kind of method in Alma Tadema's work. He's got one painting where he's, uh, he's got these figures that are laying out on, the, on a carpet or something like that, and they're half modeled. And you can see that he's, his method is to outline the figures and paint in the basic flesh tone and then to model it later. And I think Sargent did somewhat the same thing because what he says is to just get a basic half tone and then you uh, you paint the lights and darks on top on top of that. <clears throat> then there were some English uh, painters who were extremely good. Um, of course, Gainsborough was a great painter. Velasquez was a Spanish painter to the king. And, and of course, Rubens did some marvelous painting during the Baroque period. But his, I think his best portraits were his personal portraits of his children. 
because his his Baroque paintings got so busy that they just aren't uh, quite as nice as as his uh, intimate portraits of his children, like Nicholas and his son Nicholas, and, uh, and then there were, of course, his student Anthony Van Dyke was was ex extremely good English painter. Uh, Frank Benson, I believe, is a wonderful painter. Of course, he was Impressionist, an American Impressionist, painted everything, but his portraits of his children, his daughters out in the orchard, those, those were gorgeous pieces of paint. Of course, um, Joseph de Camp, um, some of those guys were really good. What's probably happened is someone has probably tugged on that piece of cloth or something that uh, not quite in the same position. Or it may just be my eyes, who knows? I think I'm ready. I'm just uh, going back into it and softening some of these hard, hard edges and uh, Actually, changing things a little bit. Um, trying to see if I have everything just uh, the way I want it. Um, I want to uh, come back to the mouth a little bit and uh, restate that line between the lips since I softened that, but I want to go back in there. I'm going to use just, what was there, crimson. And I'm going to soften a little bit the uh, shadow at the end of the mouth, and I think let's see, I'm going to go back into the corner of the of the nose here. <clears throat> it's just uh, the whole process of painting is just correcting all uh, the little things. Um, and then continuing to uh, fix any problems you might have until you're completely satisfied that you've got it. A couple of highlights <clears throat> that I see could be heightened a little bit. Uh, one on the uh, on the lips right here. I don't know if that's, maybe these highlights change from day to day a little bit. interested in, uh, in their work, or at least in one of their work works, and that was Robert Lenkiewicz, I believe. Um, <clears throat> certainly was not painting for the art market, but he did uh, a lot of really interesting paintings of, of people, uh, mostly homeless people and people who otherwise were not all that acceptable in society. As a matter of fact, he got <clears throat> uh, driven out from his studio location. 
at one point because of all these poor people who are coming to visit him. So I had to go find another studio location. That's a color I haven't used before, but I thought it might look uh, interesting on the uh, portrait, and that's called Cinnabar Green. It's kind of a greenish ochre color. Sounded like they will be making their entry in a moment here. <clears throat> <laughs> so if you want to come over here and see what I'm doing, you're welcome to ask me any questions because it certainly might. <laughs> yeah, the, the model is Lauren McLeod and, and she was in the drawing class and uh, Well, uh, let's see. It's about, what, eight hours so far? How I many? I think it's, okay. Eleven. I'll have twelve hours. Twelve hours. I'm adding a little bit of a cool color here to the, uh, to the arm, just to give it a little bit more of a pearlescent color. And uh, that think helps. <laughs> the mixing of colors. Yeah, well, color mixing is mostly a memory exercise. It truly is. I mean, you, you mix colors uh, mostly by what you remember uh, works. I mean, there are a few colors. you you. I mean, when you, when you first start painting, you uh, obviously can mix colors together that will make mud, and you don't want mud, of course, but then you find that there are colors that are friendly to one another. Um, for instance, landscape, uh, or even in portraits, uh, ultramarine, blue, yellow ochre, and alizarin crimson are color, color friendly. They go together in any combination. Um, colors that are hard to use because you've got to be really careful where you put them. Uh, burnt umber, for instance, is one that you do not use in any skin colors, except that I've used it in the very darkest accents on the, uh, on the face. So <clears throat> you just can't get it in the flesh tones because uh, the flesh tones will be messed up if you do. Can you use the burnt sienna in the flesh tone? Oh yeah, burnt sienna is very, very colorful and th that's a great shadow, shadow side color. Burnt sienna works well. As a matter of fact, that's what my dark mixtures are, but I tend to cool them a lot. I, I tend to uh, try and cool off those colors. So, for instance, in the, the flesh tones that I see here, I don't, I don't see a, little, a lot of really hot colors. I do have burnt sienna in <clears throat> some of those shadow colors right there. The face, yeah, is pretty well finished, and I, I kind of like it so far. Um, <clears throat> I was sort of comparing it to other things that I had done, and I, 
I think the face is, the color in the face is pretty good. And I might tend to adjust it later or something of that nature, but what I want to do here, I mean, uh, I won't have to have the model for all of this, but I want to uh, get the colors, especially the flesh tones and the arms and so forth from the model. And then I will be really, really be fairly uh, well finished with the model, I think. <clears throat> and we can let her go for a while so she doesn't have to suffer sitting there. Apparently she uh, enjoys it to some degree. She hasn't seen paint at all. <laughs> so we, have, we haven't put her in paint. I mean, there are, there, though, there are some poses that... Uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, I like the call. <laughs> yeah, and I've o overstated those colors, and, and I'll come back and, uh, and lighten those colors, and <clears throat> they'll be a little bit more reasonable looking, I suppose, when I get through with them, uh, because I'm, I'll model everything uh, a little more closely. So we go with burnt sienna, a little bit of... Viridian. We're just going to use that uh, dark color that I normally use. Let's see if her arm is extended just a touch more than it normally is. Can you pull that in just a little bit towards your lap? Um, okay. A little bit more. All right, you're fine. Color of the shadows. Now here's a case where I'm certainly using that burnt sienna. And in a small touch. of orange. Orange is a color that I don't use on flesh tones except in the shadows. Uh, yeah, I am eventually just uh, not, uh, I'm not sure how slavishly I will copy that. I, I do on occasion uh, copy that real carefully. Turn that way just a little bit right there. Oh, well. I'm doing the background and I'm asking her to get in position. I must be on. <laughs> how you can figure out where her head is if you don't put something when she leaves? Does it matter? Well, actually, I'll tell you, I, I did take a, a photograph of her so that I could, figure could uh, figure out where it is. And uh, that'll help me with some of these background details and stuff. Out for the camera. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't for it to like, and one side was so like, what did you do? I mean, you have to get up and walk. And I mean, yeah, I had to strengthen one side to keep it from slipping out, and I had to like loosen and stretch the other side to equalize them. Uh, I guess so. I don't know. Well, that's really <laughs> strange like, things. Like it's like an old house. <laughs> Well, we have this shadow here. Nice shadow, but we have this um, red reflected light.